This court is now back in session. Please come to order. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, we will now hear the second case on the calendar, which is uh, Crane versus the United States. It's number 19 CM 26. Uh, counsel, you may proceed. May it please the court, Alice Wang on behalf of Amicus Curiae Public Defender Service. Counsel for Appellant has indicated that she will cede all of her time to uh, PDS, and I will reserve two minutes for rebuttal. The jury trial issue in this case involves two questions. First, whether the sex offender registration and community notification requirements of SORA count as a penalty for purposes of the Blanton analysis. And second, whether that penalty is severe enough to reflect a legislative determination that misdemeanor sexual abuse of a minor is a serious offense. On the first question, Badeau held that a statutory consequence of conviction does not have to be intended as a punishment in order to count as a penalty within the meaning of Blanton. That holding substantially undermines the philosophical basis of Thomas and forecloses the government's argument here that sex offender registration is not a penalty under Blanton because its purpose is to protect public safety rather than to punish the defendant. Under Blanton and Badeau, even non-punitive statutory consequences of conviction, like deportation and revocation of a driver's license, count toward the Blanton analysis, and sex offender registration is no different. Counsel, can I ask you just abstractly, is it your view then that any consequence, any adverse consequence that is imposed as a result of conviction and as a matter of law and sufficiently tangled up in the process of conviction counts for uh, the Sixth Amendment purpose and that there's no longer any uh, distinction of meaning between uh, things that are by themselves criminal punishment and other consequences that might not be criminal punishment, but are adverse consequences. Is that, is that your view? Or do you think that there are some kinds of consequences that a legislature could impose that would be viewed by the defendant as adverse, but that are so administrative or uh, have some character that makes them not count for uh, the, you know, Blanton not to go analysis? No, I think I agree with what you said um, first, that any adverse statutory consequence of conviction would count as a penalty. That, that appears to be how Blanton treated the matter, and that appears to be what Badeau said. I mean, I think that um, there may be a, a, fu a future case that tests that principle, but I think that um, as the case law stands now, that that would be our position. Well, just a couple of examples. To, so would you, you would say restitution to a victim would count? Um, I, I think restitution is, let's see, I think the statute for that is, um, yes, I think it would count. It's actually part of the criminal sentence, in fact. Understood. I'm just, uh, and, yeah. and, uh, what, do you think that the, um, you know, the 50, I don't know what it is nowadays, the $50 or $100 sort of count by count uh, uh, assessment for purposes of the victim's fund, that also counts? Yes, I think those count as penalties. Now they may, they're probably not severe enough because the amount, Understood. yeah. Mm -hmm. and I just wanna make sure you, your view is, it used to be that maybe that there were these distinctions, conceptual and character between some you know, criminal punishment and then maybe there were some things that were criminal punishment that were penalties and then there were adverse consequences that don't even count. And you think that in light of Badeau is just not the right way of looking at it. And the right way of looking at it is if it is sufficiently tied up with the criminal conviction and it's an adverse consequence, it counts, and the issue is just how much does it weigh? I think that's right. Uh, prior to Badeau, this court had a long line of case law, like Foote, um, Ann Thomas, and Smith, many cases that, that did draw the distinction, Your Honor, was, um, was drawing a distinction between uh, criminal punishment, intended as punishment, and sort of civil remedial enactments. And uh, in Badeau, the government argued that deportation unquestionably fell on the side of, uh, you know, a non-punitive, non-punishment type of um, uh, consequence and therefore didn't count as a penalty. And this court um, I, on Vox said, yes. I, I'm sorry, can, can I just stick on restitution for a second? Because I'm curious, sure. uh, when ordering restitution, is the court ordinarily under any sort of cap or let, let, let's say, you know, we've got some misdemeanor destruction of property. 
Uh, and the property happens to be a fine work of art. And somebody, you know, takes a knife to it and slashes it. Uh, and is in order to pay restitution, you know, is, is there anything preventing a court from saying you owe a million dollars in restitution? And if that's the case, wouldn't that upper limit, which if, if I'm assuming correctly that it doesn't exist, wouldn't that mean that that would be, uh, a, be considered a serious crime under your analysis? Um, so I don't have the statute, this restitution statute in front of me, but I believe that the amount um, depends on the damages to the victim and also the defendant's financial means. Um, and um, but so, if, so but, but if, if that's the test, which is, which is kind of what I was assuming, and I don't have the statute in front of me either, so I could be wrong, uh, then it would seem the amount of restitution could be upwards of, you know, as high as one could imagine. Uh, as far as what's right. what it's, it's, it's highly unlikely that it would be a 180 day offense in that situation, I think. Um, and, you know, we certainly have never seen a case like that where it's a 180 day offense, but the restitution is, you know, in the million, you know, something that would completely bankrupt a person. I think that if that were the case, if a, if, if, if a, if a misdemeanor offense could potentially bankrupt a person and, and render them completely destitute, I think that it should count. I think that that deserves a jury trial. I think that's what the purpose of the Sixth Amendment is, is to, is to create, is to um, ensure greater procedural protections when the stakes of the criminal prosecution are so high that they could devastate a person's life. Uh, Ms. Wang, uh, yes. looking at, I understand the uh, argument being made as to why Thomas should no longer be controlling in this case, because of course, Otto and, and Blanton have somewhat, some, um, to a large degree, undercut the distinction between punishment and, and administrative, uh, um, uh, <laughs> administrative, um, burdens that may be placed on uh, a defendant. But our language in those cases, and, uh, and some of the cases that you cited, talk about Soros not being such a burdensome or such a problem uh, that it transforms, um, uh, or that the, the, the language would suggest it does not rise to the level of creating the same serious uh, concerns that we had in Vado with um, deportation. Uh, how are we to address that issue, given that that uh, was a significant part of those decisions? Yes, Your Honor, I think you're referring to um, WM and also the Supreme right. Court's decision in Smith versus Doe. Those yeah. cases were trying to apply the intent effects test to determine whether SORA imposes a criminal punishment. And so the question was not how severe is the penalty. The question is, you know, they were going through the, you know, the, the multi-factor test. And when um, Smith in particular, when it talks about how the, um, the stigma and the social ostracism caused by SORA notification, um, it says that, it's last, that it, it, it acknowledges that those things are lasting and painful but it says that it doesn't resemble a traditional shaming punishment um, because the stigma is not part of the objective of the law. And so that's just answering a different question. It's saying, uh, you know, under the intent effects test for the purposes of ex post facto and double jeopardy, the question is, does this look like traditional criminal punishment? And the court said no, um, because while the stigma is intense, it is lasting, it's painful, um, it's consequential, it's severe, it, it is not intended, it's not part of the purpose. And then what Smith also says is that um, the loss of, uh, this is something the government quotes in its brief, that the loss of housing and employment that may flow from um, notification, that it, that it flows from the fact of conviction rather than notification. But that was actually a comment on the evidence in the record in Smith and not a legal conclusion that those kinds of effects don't count toward the severity of a penalty, certainly in a, in a Sixth Amendment context. And Can I ask you, so, uh, stare decisis question. I, 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 I'm wondering whether you're making essentially a stare decisis argument, because the government relies on some more specific statements, for example, that seem to indicate that both the Supreme Court and this court thought sex offender registration was less burdensome, a less onerous consequence than parole or probation. Um, 
And so, I, I, do you think we are bound? Is that a holding that we are bound by? So if we're weighing up, uh, when we get to the stage of assuming we can count sex offender registration, how much does it weigh? How does it compare to other uh, uh, adverse consequences that this court and other courts have struggled with? Do you think we are bound by the principle that we have to assign X years of sex offender registration less weight than X years of probation when we're weighing that up? Or do you think, although we have some statements that like that and the Supreme Court has statements like that, those are sort of dicta that were directed to other legal issues and do not bind us? I mean, I don't think they're dicta in the sense that they were necessary to that holding, but that holding is a completely different holding. They're just answering different questions, I think. Um, when, when, uh, when the Supreme Court says that the burdens of registration are less onerous than probation, it's talking specifically about the, you know, in per the fact that you have to go in person to register with SORA. It's not talking about, um, for example, the privacy, the, the dissemination of a, this whole collection of private information. It's not talking about all of the, um, you know, uh, housing and employment and, uh, fi and family consequences that we cite in our brief. And I was, as I was discussing, um, what Smith says is that, th and I'd like to quote from Smith because I think this is really illustrative of why that comment is not uh, binding on this court. The, the, the court in Smith says, the record in this case contains no evidence that the act has led to substantial occupational or housing disadvantages for former sex offenders that would have otherwise occurred, that would not have otherwise occurred through the use of routine background checks by employers and landlords. The Court of Appeals identified only one incident from a seven year history of Alaska's law where a sex offender suffered community hostility and damage to his business after the information he submitted to the registry became public. And it was because of that that the court said, we don't have any evidence that, that all of these you know, uh, housing and employment and other types of disruptions are directly, are, are in fact caused by registration and notification as opposed to the fact of conviction. That was just an yeah. evidentiary uh, decision. And so which, counsel, which actually suggests let's, that, let's, yes. I mean, let's say that the registration requirement went by the wayside uh, and up pops a vigilante group called Protect, Protect Our Children and they comb every public record of any sex offender and they start a database that says, uh, these are all the sex offenders. Um, and basically they perform the same function that SORA currently does, but, but just a non-government actor. Um, so all the same consequences flow from the criminal conviction sort of in a indirect sense. Uh, would, that, would that mean that uh, this would still be a serious offense even if, it, even if the only criminal punishment was less than six months? No, because Blanton very clearly says that the penalty needs to be state action. And the penalty here is the notification provision, which is specifically designed to inform people um, about sex offenders in their community so that they can avoid them. That is the express purpose of the notification provision. And just, so, just one, one, one more question, and I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off, but uh, just, just a hypothetical that kind of nags at me, and I'm wondering what your thoughts on it are. Let's, let's say tomorrow we learn that 0.1% of the population are, are super carriers of the coronavirus, that they are asymptomatic and just super spreaders. Um, and so the DC Council makes it a crime punishable by $5 to cough in public. And then if you're also a super spreader, you go on a, regist a registry permanently that says this person is a super spreader. Um, is coughing in public so serious? Doesn't seem like it, uh, even though there might be a huge stigma uh, attached to being on that registry. People might not want to hang around you if they find out you're a super spreader of coronavirus. Uh, so when it really looks so non-punitive, you, would you still consider that to be a punishment to raise this to a level of a serious offense? I know there's a lot in there. <laughs> um, I think that there's some, perhaps some distinctions, um, but you know, the, the record at this point, uh, you know, 20 years, uh, now we're like 25 years into Sora, is that when someone's on a sex offender registry, um, th there's a good chance their life is going to be ruined forever. Uh, and, and, uh, and people know that. And, and in fact, the DC Council specifically singled out sex offenses, and particularly sex offenses against minors, as so dangerous that, that, they, that people want to know about it. And, and I think that that's another thing that, you know, your, your honor's example about coughing in public being sort of, um, you know, a, a 
a sort of intuitively petty offense. Um, sex abuse of a minor is absolutely not that. And in fact, um, it is the council specifically targeted that offense to place it as a classify it as a, as a class B registration offense, which, um, you know, all of the other class B offenses are punishable by at least five years in prison. So that that suggests that the legislature views sex abuse of a minor, even though it's a 180 day offense, um, as on par with all these other very serious offenses. And so Can I ask about another aspect of your answer earlier, you were distinguishing Smith in part by referring to the discussion of the fact that there had been no evidence in the case. And although there's information that has been brought to our attention on appeal uh, in support of the idea that SOAR registration is very onerous and has a variety of adverse consequences, there isn't really evidence in the sense of a record of fact made at the trial because this issue was not specifically raised in the trial court. And the government argues that the issue isn't really before us for plenary review, but rather is subject to plain error review because although a request was made uh, for a, uh, a jury trial and an assertion was made that the Constitution entitles, uh, uh, entitled Ms. Crane to that, uh, the reason that was given did not mention SORA and instead is a little murky maybe, but seemed more to be the uh, argument made kind of in dissent in Badeau, which was, look, uh, it's really weird that people who are non-citizens are going to get the benefit of a jury trial when charged with this offense if citizens don't. So the defense attorney seemed to say to the trial judge, I think that like the dissent said, if, if non-citizens are getting a jury trial with this charge, then my client should too. And the trial court seemed to say, I don't see that as a good argument in light of Badeau. That does seem like a very different set of points than the argument now, which is Sora. Think about Sora. That issue was left open in Bideau, and uh, you know, then here are a whole bunch of legal arguments, and maybe here's factual information that would be relevant to those legal arguments, and really none of that uh, brought to the trial court's attention. So uh, do you think that that should affect how the, whether we reach this issue, and if so, how, or do you think that uh, what was said was enough? Um, so I'd I, I will answer the preservation um, question, but I also just want to um, say that in terms of evidence in the record, I think that this court can very much take judicial notice of the cases that we cite in our brief that talk about how there has been ample evidence sort of in the social science record. We, we cite many social science studies. The, the, the government doesn't dispute, really the government doesn't dispute um, the, the central premise that um, stigma caused by the sex offender registry and notification provisions is, is, is severe. They actually don't dispute that. They just say you shouldn't look at it because it's this indirect effect or, you know, they, they, they sort of cite Smith and for, and for the reasons I explained, I don't think Smith answers the question, but they don't actually dispute the evidentiary, the, the factual point that, that, um, that registration and notification can cause very severe impacts on a person's life. And I think many, many state courts have recognized that. So I don't think there needs, there, there needed to be sort of evidence put on the record. Um, Smith versus Doe was a civil case. You know, it was the plaintiff's burden to put on evidence about that. And this is a, a, a different situation. But, you know, certainly uh, uh, um, in Badeau, Mr. Badeau himself didn't put on evidence about the, the, uh, the likelihood of persecution or poverty if he were sent back to his home country. And yet the court used that as, as, as an example of why deportation is severe. So as to preservation though, um, the government reads the uh, reads defense counsel's um, reference to the dissent or decent. It's a, there's a misspelling in the record, um, but the government uh, actually reads that as a reference to Judge Washington's concurrence, and Judge Washington's concurrence it specifically talks about how um, there are many civil consequences of conviction that are. Uh, that are potentially just as severe as deportation. He cites Judge, uh, Justice Gorsuch's opinion in Demaya for that proposition. And so I think that, um, I don't think counsel was referring to this, this sort of policy argument that citizens should get the same uh, rights as, as non-citizens because that was actually specific, that was an argument specifically rejected in Badeau. Badeau said, if you're not, uh, subject to deportation, you don't, deportation doesn't apply to you. So I don't see why, it, it seems to be the least likely argument that counsel would, would point to 
an argument that was explicitly rejected in Badeau. It's much more likely that counsel was referring to what Judge Washington was talking about in terms of there's now that Badeau has sort of opened the door to this panoply of you know, other penalties, we need to assess penalty by penalty what the severity is. And then- Well, I agree with you that, abstractly. I mean, I agree with you abstractly that it, what, if what defense attorney was arguing was my client should get this simply in virtue of being a citizen, then that wouldn't be a good argument in light of Badeau because as, you know, the Badeau had, reject, uh, had rejected that argument. But I guess I'm hung up because the only specific attribute of uh, the client that was mentioned was that the client was a citizen. Uh, I mean, you know, so I, I agree in the abstract, it might be unlikely, but my, my, what I struggle with is that it seems to be specifically what was said, and therefore I'm not sure what else to read into it. Well, what, what I think you can, uh, you know, you just take it at face value that the, this, ca this court's case law has two, I think, very strong, strongly established principles that apply here. One is that once a claim is raised, any argument, um, can be uh, can be uh, raised on appeal in support of that claim. I think the claim that Ms. Crane was entitled by the Sixth Amendment to a jury trial in light of the principles en enunciated in Badeau was, was clearly presented. And then the second principle is that even if the argument, the specific argument was not presented below, that as long as the trial judge ruled on it, then that it is that uh, this court can review it de novo or review it um, uh, plenary. And, and that's what happened. The judge said, Okay, I hear what you're saying. You're saying Bado, um, and that you. I look at the principles, the arguments made in Bado. That was what the what the counsel said, and the judge said, um, I don't read Bado that way. Uh, my ruling is that if you are not someone who can be deported as a result of this um, this offense, then you don't get a jury trial. Bottom case closed, and that was error and that uh, that was the ruling and any more specific arguments were not going to avert that error because the judge's ruling was that if you if that this is not a jury demandable offense under the statute and if you do not if you're not subject to deportation you do not get a jury trial under the constitution Can I ask, are, are you are you making something like an appellate waiver argument as well let's say i think the government's reading of the trial court uh, of, of the defense counsel's trial court argument, the reference to the dissent, uh, the government is mistaken when they say that was apparently a reference to Judge Washington's concurrence. Uh, and I think that, you know, Judge McLeese has articulated the better reading that what they're saying is, you know, uh, the dissent says if it's good enough for people who aren't citizens, it's good enough for people who are citizens. And that, that's the argument they were raising. Now, does the fact that the government interprets it as a reference to the Judge Washington's concurrence, is that, are you suggesting that's something like an appellate waiver? I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, I think that the government has taken a position and that's the position that this, you know, that they're bound by. And I think that it's also just persuasive that the government itself is reading it that way. So that's a persuasive reason to, to read it that way. Um, and also the other thing is, you know, this is a purely legal argument or legal issue that has been fully briefed. The court has taken the time to, to have argument on it. And it's an important recurring issue, as the government keeps pointing out, um, in, that, it, that comes up in many cases and superior courts need guidance on it. And so it, um, you know, this court should, can and should decide the legal issue. Even if it decides it on plain error review, it should still decide the merits of the issue as it did in the Michael Thomas case, and then announce that it's plain up, up, upon plain at the time of appellate consideration after it recognizes the error. Um, that, that is, that is the, um, the policy reason for doing that in Michael Thomas exists in this case, and it would, um, we think that is that what this court should do if it finds the error is that the claim is not preserved. We think that I, claim is I, preserved, but. I, I'm not sure what the policy reason is in Michael Thomas, and maybe you can help me out with that, but does, does it change your answer a bit? You know, no, both, both you and the government have noted um, there is another case raising the same issue coming up, uh, seems to be relatively soon. Um, so does that, does that cut against the policy argument that you're pressing? No, because that was the same case in Thomas too, that the, the DEA 7 issue was raised in many cases in that case as well. I think that the policy argument that um, was made in Thomas was that this is an important legal issue that recurs and that, uh, you know, 
it's it's been fully briefed. It's been uh, th that that there should be guidance on the issue, um, and this is a case that we think we think that the claim is preserved because counsel said my client is entitled to a jury trial in light of the arguments made in Bado. And that was the claim that was raised. And there have been, you know, uh, there are arguments in favor of that claim that were not presented with specificity, but that is not required for this court to review the, the error, the claim of error. Uh, thank you, counsel. We're uh, well over time. We will give you some time in rebuttal, and uh, now we'll hear from the government. Unless my thank colleagues you. have any questions, they haven't had a chance to work in. All right, uh, Mr. Hansford. Good morning, and may it please the court, Eric Hansford for the United States. To find a right to a jury trial in this case, you must find an appellant's favor on three key points. First, you must find that Botto overruled Thomas, even though Botto repeatedly said that it was not addressing sex offender registration. Second, you must find that sex offender registration qualifies as a penalty, even though case law consistently explains that it is not a punishment. And third, you must find that sex offender registration qualifies as severe, even though it's less restrictive than probation, and case law consistently finds that probation does not qualify as severe. Can I ask you on the first of those points why you use the word overrule? That seems kind of like, I mean, I, I, there's no question that Badeau did not expressly overrule uh, Thomas because it left open the question of, uh, you know, of SOAR registration. Um, and the terminology we've used seems to be somewhat less stringent than that. Uh, and the issue is whether, uh, I guess, Padilla and Badeau together uh, substantially undermine the jurisprudential or philosophical underpinnings of Thomas. So are you, are you actually try, uh, suggesting that it has to be overruling or do you acknowledge that something short of that can suffice? I, I guess I think of overruling as including implicit overruling. It doesn't, we acknowledge it doesn't have to be an explicit overruling, but I think for this court. No, no, but I mean, uh, you know, over, well, it depends what you, I guess, or think the word overrule means, but um, if a, you know, there's an earlier decision that has one stated ground of reasoning and there were, you know, several other uh, 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 grounds that were presented and not decided, so the court holds a thing, and then that's undermined, you, I don't know whether you'd say we overrule it or we'd say that, you know, now we need to reconsider this issue anew, the only ground for ruling was, is, is no longer uh, uh, something we can rely on, so we're not overruling it, we're just uh, you know, reconsidering it because one of its grounds has been undermined. But your view is, if uh, the only time a division is free to reconsider a ruling is when the division is required to do so. In other words, the division can't say, you know, really the earlier decision has been drawn into question, and so we need to think it again anew, and we can come out either way, but it's been really undermined, so we need to rethink it. You don't think there's room for that. You think that the only time a division can come out differently from an earlier decision on a point of law is if that's the only option, the only conclusion could be that the earlier decision is invalid in light of the later decision. Is that fair or am I, I overstating I, I think that's right. And I think we point to the Washington case that we cite in the supplemental brief where it's two judges in the majority and one judge in the dissent and the majority says, we're especially reluctant to say that something has been implicitly undermined or overruled um, because there is a dissent in this case. And so for the principles of stability of three court judges, uh, three judge panels, um, that that is, there's, there is some sort of um, need for, to have a consensus that- Well, I, for sure. I mean, it's certainly true we said we don't lightly do it, but I wonder whether you're going too far. And I have in mind cases like Smith about Rule 35 or the cases where this court has kind of followed along behind the Supreme Court in its revision of what things are jurisdictional and what things aren't. We said in those cases, we have a holding from this court under, you know, interpreting our rule that says this is jurisdictional or, uh, or the like. And the Supreme Court has said some other things, not binding on us. Um, so we, you know, we, we won't act unlawfully. We're not required to abandon what we've done before. But given that the Supreme Court has looked at this and has reached conclusions that are different from ours, 
we think it's appropriate to rethink and as a division, not going on bonk, decide whether we want to adhere to what we have done before. And if that's true, I wonder if maybe you have overstated how stringent the requirement is. I guess I'm not sure there's much daylight between the standards that we're articulating. I, I'm not trying to articulate a standard different from what's been said under the case law. Um, well, I mean, Kel, I mean, let me ask you a question about that, because your brief seems to say, look, Bado expressly reserves the question of whether or not SORA is a penalty. And if, if it does that, I read your brief to say, then it can't have, I think you use the word overruled, but, you know, substantially undermined Thomas. And I think uh, that's inconsistent with the view that Judge McLeese is expressing that, you know, Bado could substantially undermine uh, Thomas without while still preserving the issue for future consideration. But, but you seem to think that those two things are inconsistent. I, I don't think, I, I do not think they're inconsistent. Okay. I think there can be cases where it is substantially undermined. I, what we're pointing out is Bado had this exact issue teed up, briefed fully in Bado, whether sex offender registration qualifies for a jury trial. And what Bado said is, we're not going to decide that question. And so we cite a Fourth Circuit case that says, when you're explicitly saying you're not resolving this question, it's odd to read the opinion as implicitly resolving that question. And I think that's, that's our primary point there. You know, I, I think we've done it time and again in the jurisdictional cases that Judge McLeese is talking about. I think in, you know, the opinion in Deloach, uh, which I think was in June, uh, the question was whether or not this court's rule four was jurisdictional, a question that had been expressly preserved, uh, expressly uh, set aside in prior opinions that held other rules were non-jurisdictional. And then that we didn't consider that to be a hang up to say, but yeah, for the same reasons as those cases offer, this one's also non-jurisdictional. I mean, I, I suppose I doubt whether or not that Fourth Circuit case, if it's you know accurately represented, and I assume it is, uh, really reflects our practice. So I, I think it's, I think the difference is, it's not just that it preserves this issue, it's that there's a prior precedent that's on point. And then there, it was, there, was, there wasn't Deloach too, though, counsel. I mean, Deloach was the same. There's a rule four, rule four cases saying non-jurisdictional. So, so, I mean, I think it's on all fours. Uh, I, I, I do not think we're urging substantially different standards here. Um, I, I do think that- Can we then move on to how to apply that standard? Sure. And so your opponent's argument is, Thomas is kind of, I, I don't, this is putting it more harshly than your opponent does. So I, Thomas is in a way kind of a simplistic opinion. It just looked, you know, before Badeau, it looked at a consequence and it said, you were going to figure out whether it is like criminal punishment. It really isn't. It's on, you know, the wrong side of a binary distinction. And uh, your opponent's argument is that way of thinking is just not a, a sufficiently, uh, uh, it's not the correct uh, uh, analytical structure. And Bedeau tells you, if something is an adverse consequence enough, and if it is tied up intimately enough with uh, the uh, conviction, you know, those, and those issues could, you know, generate uh, controversy at the margins, then it doesn't matter if you're going to call it punishment for, certain, for other principles of law. And why, why is that not a, a fair point that if we were coming at this issue after a de novo or, or, or for the first time after Badeau, we wouldn't write anything like Thomas. We would have to grapple with, well, what kind, you know, maybe we would accept uh, 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 PDS's argument that if it's an adverse consequence and it's tied up intimately enough, that's all we need to know. Maybe we would start trying to draw distinctions among consequences that are criminal punishment, but we didn't do any of that in Thomas, and it would be work that would be left for us if we were considering it now in light of Bideau. And so why isn't it uh, reasonable for a division of the court to step back and say, wow, we really need to think this through. It's more complicated than we thought of Thomas. Let's see what the answer is in light of Bideau and, you know, a more detailed inquiry into Noctegall and, and what, you know, driver, the consideration of uh, suspension of driver's licenses. What's wrong with uh, uh, that, that approach to this topic? So I, I think there were a few ideas in there. Let me start with what it was that Thomas said and then go to the adverse consequences being a penalty. So starting with what Thomas said, Thomas is 
in, in saying it is a penal, it is not a penal law, it is instead a remedial regulatory action. Um, of course, what penal literally means is related to a penalty in the context of deciding whether there's a blatant penalty, but maybe more importantly, where that language that Thomas pulls comes from is this court's decision in In Re Doe, which Thomas cites. In Re Doe is not a Fifth Amendment case. It's not about criminal punishment. It's a statutory construction case on SORA trying to decide what statutory canon applies. Penal laws, of course, are to be construed narrowly. Remedial laws are to be construed liberally. That penal laws includes both civil and criminal penalties. And so what In Re Doe says is, this is not a penal law, this is a remedial regulation, and therefore we're going to construe it liberally. And almost word for word, that's where that language in Thomas comes from. So when right. it is- I ask you though, so do you think, um, uh, what side of the distinctions you're drawing here between penal non-criminal punishments, you know, penal consequences that are non-criminal punishment, uh, in some sense of the term, what side do you think uh, uh, for a DWI or DUI case, uh, driver's license suspension falls on? Is it appropriately considered uh, or not appropriately considered? I, I think it would depend on the driver's license, the particular driver's license suspension, but I think it is a traditional penalty for- It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a surprising answer, given that Blanton didn't seem to really investigate that so much. I mean, that's, that was the same consequence that was in Blanton. I don't recall the Supreme Court diving into Nevada's statutory regime and asking questions like, is it regulatory? Uh, does it fit in, is it in the CFR or something like that? Uh, so I would, I would think you're bound by the answer it seemed to be a simple yes. So I, I think that there could, we agree that in Blanton, it, Supreme Court treats it as a penalty. I'm not saying, we're not, not every D, uh, driver's license suspension is necessarily going to be a penalty, but we agree sure. that- Sure, there's not the Supreme Court. There's a, your opponent's cite a Ninth Circuit case which held that for a, a DUI or DWI type offense, uh, a 15 year driver's license suspension was not only appropriately taken into account in determining whether the offense was petty or serious, but in combination with whatever the sentence was there, which was less than what we have here as I vaguely recall, uh, made the offense serious and therefore entitled the defendants to a jury trial. Do you think that case is incorrectly decided? Uh, we, I, I don't, I guess I don't take a position on that. Botto certainly did cite that case as well. So we're not taking issue with that case. I think it's an Eighth Circuit case. But if I could go back to Judge McLeese's um, adverse consequences, the second part of the question about whether a penalty is every single adverse consequence, for one, I don't think it was on the table for Botto to be defining what it is a penalty is. Botto says in the introduction to part four, uh, Padilla said that deportation is a severe penalty. The government does not disagree that deportation is a penalty, is a severe penalty. And the only question is whether uh, deportation is the type of penalty that counts under the Blanton analysis. So it is not changing the definition. Can I ask you how you think we're supposed, if we're drawing a distinction between criminal punishments like incarceration, they're definitely counted. And uh, things that are in some sense in, uh, adverse consequences imposed as a result of conviction, but don't count. Uh, what, are, what attributes are we supposed to be considering? What is the, what is the, the analytical framework to know which side of uh, the fence to throw things on that puts immigration on one side and sex offender registration on the other. But I gather you would agree puts probation to which you compare sex offender registration on the penalty side. So what, what, what's the framework you think we should be applying if we have a somewhat, you know, if, if we're drawing that line and I, if immigration I, is on the other side of that line? I, I think it's whether uh, there's an intent to punish um, by the legislature that you can see through the um, objective facts as to- that, that seems like the definition for whether it's criminal punishment for purposes. I mean, for, for example, immigration. I mean, the Supreme Court's immigration cases make clear that it's not criminal punishment for purposes of all the procedural protections under the constitution. So people can get deported through civil, I mean, there, there are some protections, but not the criminal law protections or proof beyond a reasonable doubt or the like. So. I mean, immigration is a good example of how it's 
these words like punishment are uh, ambiguous and vary depending on context. Uh, if the inquiry is, is it criminal punishment, then Bedeau is incorrectly decided. So uh, because it, that's it, not criminal punishment. We, we fully agree that Bado is about criminal and civil penalties, criminal and civil punishment. And that does Bado does Bado somewhere say that immigration is intended to punish? And that is why we are calling it a penalty? Say that again, sorry. Does Bedeau reflect the line of thinking you're suggesting, which is, we've got to figure out whether this is a penalty. Here's how we're going to do it. Is, the, is immigration intended to punish? Yes, it is. Therefore, it falls as a penalty for purposes of the uh, Sixth Amendment jury trial inquiry. That isn't really what Bedeau looks like. Bedeau looks like, mostly, this is a really serious consequence that is intimately intertwined with the criminal system. Um, so I'm just wondering where the, the line of thinking you're getting, how well it, it, it squares with the actual reasoning of Bado. Well, I, I just don't think Bado has to address that issue because everyone agrees that it's a punishment. And Bado does lay out the steps of figuring out a Blanton inquiry. Do you mean a punishment or do you mean a penalty? A penalty. A, because but, I don't think it, you, I, I, I think assume it, you draw a distinction between those two or maybe you don't. No. No, and I think indeed Blanton uses them as synonyms. In the language that we quote in the brief, Blanton uses punishment and penalty as synonyms. And I think Counsel, that is far more controlling. Counsel, let, let, let's say tomorrow uh, prisons are abolished and in their place are re-education centers. Uh, and depending on the offense, you have to spend a certain number of years in a re-education center to reorient uh, your thinking and behavior to the community at large. Uh, and the legislature says these are not punitive at all. Uh, these are pure, the, the severity of the offense just tells us how long you need to be re-educated. Uh, and that is why we're sending you to a re-education center. Not, not to be punitive, to re-educate. Uh, is that no longer uh, a punishment under the Blanton analysis? No, that would still be a punishment because why? What, you're looking at, what you're looking at is the objective characteristics of what this consequence has. And but I thought so, you just told me we were looking at an intent to punish. And, I, 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 but where you're drawing that is the objective characteristics. I think, I think maybe a few examples would be helpful um, in terms of adverse consequences that flow from a criminal conviction that are not, um, I don't think we would say are penalties. So for example, um, in Smith, this court considered the firing of a police officer, the termination of a police officer based on a criminal conviction. Was, was, that, written, was that written as part of the offense? Any, any police officer who commits this offense shall be fired? So it, it was in the DC code that a police officer who commits an offense, um, or at least is, it's possible to be terminated on that ground. And so just to make sure, for example, just to see how far you take this. I mean, one observation, which is some of these examples that you're referring to, like they might not be state action or they may or may not be very uh, closely uh, tied to the criminal conviction, like required to be imposed by law as part of sentence or the like. So some of the, that may be some of the variables. But just if, 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 if tomorrow the legislature, there might be other constitutional problems with legislation like this, but imagine the legislature passed a law tomorrow that said anybody who commits is found guilty of the offense of misdemeanor sexual abuse of a child uh, may never be employed in the District of Columbia again. Would you say petty offense, not the right kind of consequence? May never be employed anywhere in the District of Columbia or again? No, no employer in the District of Columbia. And, and imagine that that is, uh, you know, it, it's part of the definition of the crime and the statutory list of consequences. And it is an order that the trial court issues at the time of sentencing. So it's all as, as entangled as it could be. That the trial court issues an order also you know, saying the defendant may not seek or uh, have employment uh, in the District of Columbia. Uh, so I, I think that's very, I, I think that's very likely to be viewed as a punishment. It's, rest, it's a restriction. It's not just a notification. Um, it's, it is. Well, what makes it a punishment other than the, the severity of its consequences? So, I think, I think if the, the Smith v. Doe and the WM, they're dealing, they're grappling with these very issues in the very context of sex offender registration. And it's going through and it's saying, you know, it might seem like this is, a is like a colonial shaming penalty, 
but it's not. That's a misleading analogy when you actually look at the details of what's going on here. And it might seem like sex offender registration is what's driving these consequences, but in fact, there's every reason to think it's just being a sex offender that's driving the consequences as opposed to registration. And just on the argument that that's somehow based on the Smith v. Doe record and that there's some other record here, Smith v. Doe is talking about, it, it's talking generally. There, it does make occasional references to the record, but it's giving a general um, explanation. And indeed in the concurrence by Justice Souter, it's citing some of the same cases that PDS is relying on. So it, Smith v. Doe and then WM is rejecting this notion that sex offender registration or notification is what's driving these consequences. Can I, can I ask just on kind of the big picture point, something that bothers me a little bit is, you know, there are a lot of offenses, burglary, drug offenses, DUI offenses, that I think it's safe to say have a very high recidivism rate. For none of them is our aversion to a reoffense so high that society goes to the great lengths to set up a registry of all of those offenders. Now, you're, you and, and Ms. Wang are both very focused on sort of the severity of you know, the impingement on the individual and whether or not that is a serious penalty. Where I tend to, you know, my, my mind gravitates to the question of why are we so averse to reoffending in this little area of the law, if not because we take that offense to be particularly serious? So I think a couple of things, just factually, there are other registries of crime. Indeed, DC has a DC gun offender registry where it's similar to the sex offender registry, except for there's not a notification aspect, but the police collect this data on gun offenders and share it within law enforcement to uh, be able to monitor um, potential gun crimes. And so I think that-, that Well, I guess most of the gun crimes are jury demandable. Maybe I, 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 yeah, unregistered uh, possession of an unregistered firearm and unlawful possession of ammunition may not be, uh, but uh, most of them are actually jury demandable. So I'm not sure that example, if the other registries are for offenses that are ordinarily jury demandable, it, it, that may not uh, advance your argument as much as you uh, may suggest. Well, I think they're not all jury demandable, but I also think it undercuts the argument that this is especially, um, this is showing that sex offender registration is a penalty. I well, think it undermines I, the idea that it's uniquely serious. I'm not sure it undermines the idea that it is viewed as particularly serious and in need of uh, uh, governmental response. I, I guess I'm just not sure how giving the government your information because you're a gun offender transforms it into a penalty if but all not, you're it's, doing it's it's not disseminated to the public though is that right right that that's correct and but smith v doe and wm go through why it is that we have this public dissemination that there are higher fears about um about reoffenses with sex offender registry yeah that's that, um, I mean, that's that, that's, the, the, that's what concerns me though counsel i mean uh, for all i know once a jaywalker always a jaywalker once a litterer always a litterer uh, and we could perform the same function by having a registry of jaywalkers and of litterers and of people who write forged checks, which is jury demandable, uttering a false instrument. Uh, but we don't. I think because we might say those are petty offenses. If they do it again, not such a big deal. When it comes to child sexual abuse, I think you'd have a hard time uttering that sentence. And I think that's why we have a registry for it. I think I agree that the point of the registry tree is to prevent um, reoffending and to try to put the public on notice that there are people who are dangerous in the community. I think that's what Smith and Doe goes to. If I could just briefly address the severity aspect, we do think that the uh, comparisons with probation are telling. The court has consistently held that probation does not qualify even though there can be very, very stringent restrictions with probation. You can, can I ask you, I, I, I hinted at this before, and I, I get your point about that comparison on the severity side. When you make the point though, I start struggling with your argument that sex offender registration is not the right kind of consequence. Because if you're saying that they're similar and therefore uh, you, you know, uh, probation shows you the sex offender registration is not severe, 
why doesn't the similarity argue for the idea that it ought to be on the same side of the ledger at least as probation, which is something we consider in trying to figure out whether something is or is not uh, 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 serious in virtue of the consequences imposed on it, sometimes called penalties, sometimes just other terms that might be used. So I, I think the cases say it's less severe, not comparable in severity. But just to be clear, you don't have to agree with me on the penalty consequence argument I'm making. If the court agrees that it's not severe, that should be the end of the case. That means there's no um, jury trial, basis for a jury trial here. And these probation conditions can indeed be very severe. Um, can, can, I, can you help me with a, an aspect of this case I struggle with? Sure. Um, which is kind of how you accumulate the various options of severity to make an overall judgment of, of severity for an offense. The, uh, at times, your opponent argues in a way that seems mathematically very logical that uh, the Supreme Court has said you accumulate all the penalties. And we know that uh, six months, which I guess can vary depending on the day it's imposed from like 181 to 184 days, let's say 185 days. We know that that is on the wrong side of the seriousness line by way of total consequence imposed. And your opponent's argument at times is, okay, if this offense is 180 days, so the government has very little additional seriousness to play with here. If the, whatever is being added and, and counted in the mix is more than five days worth of seriousness, five days of incarceration worth of seriousness, then the government will be on the wrong side of the line. And that's a hard way of looking at it in part because it's hard to interconvert uh, other forms of punishment. And that's part of why the Supreme Court has drawn the lines that it has. But um, I can see the logic of that way of looking at it. And it does seem to be suggested by the, you know, the, the, the idea that you accumulate them all. Um, on the other hand, as you point out, there's Noctegal and there is the earlier case, I guess, Frank, uh, where the court has, you know, 180 days and then depending on sequencing of events, you could end up with a lot of probation and 180 days, which seems like it doesn't fit very well in that model. So can you help uh, uh, explain how we're supposed to add them all together, but the, the math results come out the way they do in, in Frank and Noctegal? Is it the, is the court really saying that uh, five years of probation equals less than five days of incarceration or what's going on do you think? It, and it can't even be that because Natigal and Frank have six months of, of incarceration as the maximum. So in other words, you're right at the line in those cases. Those are not 180 day cases. Um, and so I, I think it's that you have what you are looking for is you are looking for the rare unusual case where there's such a severe penalty that you overcome this presumption. You're starting with a presumption that it is not serious based on the jail sentence. And then you have to have some sort of clear reflection by the legislature that you're in the rare situation it's overcome. And indeed in Bado, I think- And, and what would you say to uh, the hypothetical of lifetime probation? So let's say that uh, the sex offender statute was, uh, in addition, to, well, you know, life probation plus sex offender registration, lifetime, both. Uh, so you, you, you know, it's a six, it's a, uh, a 180 day offense. It's a misdemeanor sexual abuse of a child and the penalty, well, the adverse consequences imposed as a result of conviction in the judgment of conviction are a maximum penalty of 180 days incarceration plus lifetime probation plus lifetime sex offender registration. You say not uh, jury demandable? I, I think it's a far harder case. And honestly, I would want to look more at case law and see if there's anything comparable. I think Frank does suggest that adding probation on top of a six months of incarceration, just probation is not the type of penalty that's ever going to qualify as severe. But I think lifetime type um, uh, consequences are far are far harder and I did just want to make one factual clarification in terms of the effect of the sex offender registration um, the DC offender registry which WM discusses it does not make public a home address it does not make public an employer what it makes public is the block of the home address and the block of the employment and WM finds this telling um, and finds this important that that is not nearly as personal of information and also in terms of the effects on the registrant 
a lot of those consequences in other jurisdictions that do make the actual home address public or make the actual employer public, you may not have those sorts of consequences with the DC sex offender registry based on how it's block specific rather than address specific. And so I think that undermines the reliance on all of those law review articles and blog posts uh, that PDS is citing because the sex offender registration does vary considerably jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, and I think those differences do matter. I, I have a, a question about Frank, uh, yeah. and I, may, maybe it's a knock to golf too, but I don't remember. I believe part of the analysis in Frank is this five year term of probation uh, is available for federal offenses to all petty crimes. Um, so it can't be that everything that we're otherwise saying is petty uh, is a serious offense by virtue of this five years probation. It's widely available. Judges have some discretion on whether or not to impose it. Um, whereas, in con contrast, this registration requirement is available for no other offense. Uh, there's nothing quite like it. And the only other, I mean, no other offense that's punishable by, by less than five years. Uh, so it's not like saying, it, it, this is not the type of consequence that extends from any other thing that we would call petty, which was not true in Frank. I, I think it, but I think, Frank is going to apply outside of the federal context. So it applies to state probationary sentences, even if those do vary based on the crime. And I think that what you have to do under Botto and Blanton is you have to look at the severity of the crime and how you look at the severity is the actual punishment, the actual consequence. You're not trying to interpret whether or not the legislature might have seen it as serious based on you know, these smoke signals, what you're looking at. And I think the Miller case, um, that's the follow on Debato explains this, you're looking at the maximum authorized penalty because that's the objective signal of whether or not the legislature sees this as a serious crime. Council, um, I know we're, we're well over time. So if you wanna sure. take a sentence and wrap up, we'll. Uh... Uh, move on to rebuttal. So if, if, sure. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say last on the preservation point that the there is no way that a, a trial court could have known that this was the grounds for the request, that this is what defense counsel was thinking about. And I think there's every reason to doubt based on the record that defense counsel was thinking about sex offender registration. And so given that we do want a ruling on the merits, but we do not think there should be a new jury trial ordered in this case. Thank you, counsel. Uh, uh, Ms. Quang will give you four minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, first, I'd like to address um, Judge Deal's point about um, kind of the big picture here. The, the whole purpose of the Blanton analysis and of um, reviewing the severity of the penalty is because it is a tool. It's, it's evidence of what the legislature thinks is a serious offense. And and Blanton does not say it's the sole measure. It says it's the most relevant evidence. But when you have extremely direct evidence from the structure and purpose of the penalty that shows you that the legislature chose to put these penalties on a particular offense, misdemeanor sexual abuse of a child or minor, because it views it as a particularly serious offense that people fear the most, because people view it, the society views it as a serious offense. That is very strong evidence of, of, what, of the ultimate question here. And it is, is nothing like um, the five-year probation period in Nachtigal. I'd like to address, um, this goes to Judge McLeese's question about accumulation. Um, so the Supreme Court in Nachtigal did not really just didn't, didn't even think about what it would mean to have six months of, or six, one day short of six months of prison plus five years of probation. That was not raised. It just, it, they only looked at the severity of the five-year term of probation as an alternative to imprisonment, not I, as an addition. I, I, I agree with you, Anoctadol. I mean, they refer to it as an alternative a few times, but they do seem to uh, consider that in Frank. Um, I, I, well, I think that the, there's, there's a couple of ways to distinguish, I, and I, I apologize, I actually haven't looked at Frank recently, um, but, but this is actually far worse than any five-year period of probation. First of all, it's 10 years. It's twice as long, and it, it, and it includes notification 
which is really the part that is the most harmful to the defendant. Probationers typically do not have people harassing them, firing them from jobs, and kicking them out of their apartments. And you know, no other offense does that. Even the gun registry is only two years and it doesn't have notification. And the reason that notification is important is because it reflects the legislature's decision that this is such a serious crime, people need to know about it so that they can avoid people who've committed this crime. That's the purpose of notification is to let others know about these offenders because it's such a serious crime that they may well want to avoid them. And that is not part of, that's just not part of the penalty of probation at all. Um, and so um, there's, I think that we are, this court is bound by Badeau and what Badeau says on page 1257 is that if viewed together with the maximum period of incarceration, the penalties severity and their penalties is plural with the apostrophe after the S, the penalties severity is comparable to a prison sentence of more than six months the Sixth Amendment entitles the accused to a jury trial. So Badeau very much self-consciously, and I think in a couple of other places too, it does the same thing, where it's talking about the two-step Blanton analysis. It says the second step is an evaluation of the penalties viewed together are sufficiently severe to warrant a jury trial by comparison to the possibility of imprisonment for more than six months. So Badeau very explicitly says that you do look at the combination of the prison sentence and the additional penalty to see if combined their severity approximates the severity of a six month sentence or a six month and one day sentence. And I don't think there's really any dispute that if anyone were to choose between six months and one day in prison and 180 days and 10 years of sex offender registration notification, everyone would pick that extra day in prison. And that is because of how incredibly damaging notif community notification is. And, 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 the reason, and the reason that community notification is damaging is something that Judge Deal referred to, is because all of society views sex, offender, sex offenses, particularly against minors, as incredibly serious offenses, um, no matter what the punishment is. And that is, that is why you don't see stigma related to a gun registry or a, if there were a you know, DUI registry, if there were a, uh, you know, unlawful entry registry, that that may, you could notify everyone, but I would bet that the consequences to those people's lives would not be nearly as damaging as they are to sex offenders. And the reason is because society views, that's, that's a good reflection, that's good evidence that society views these offenses as serious. And again, Blanton, the whole line of Blanton cases talks about how the reason we are looking at the penalty is because we, wanna, we want evidence of what society views the offense as. It's not even, I mean, the legislature just sort of speaks for society, but what we're ultimately caring about is whether society views the offense as serious. Um, and here you have severity of the penalty um, being tied to the seriousness of the offense within the structure of the statute and the legislature choosing to pick misdemeanor sexual abuse of a minor is the only misdemeanor in the entire DC code to, re to warrant this type of intensive long-term government monitoring and community notification. So uh, we don't think this has anything like the five-year period of probation in Noctegal. Um, we think that when, um, if, the, if the court doesn't have further questions on penalty, I will just pivot very briefly back to, I'm sorry, on the severity, I would just pivot very briefly back to um, penalty that the I think that the bottom line is that whatever you want to call the semantics whether you know the line is civil versus criminal or punishment or punitive versus remedial that there was no dispute at, at all that in in Bado that deportation and revocation of a driver's license are not intended as punishment and yet they were considered penalties and it was not at all true that the notion of what is a penalty is not dispute, was not disputed. I mean, if you look at the dissents, the, the dissents themselves say that deportation is not a penalty because it's not intended for punishment. So that was very much a live issue in Badeau. And while Badeau said, we are not going to decide the question of whether sex offender registration um, by itself is a severe enough penalty to trigger a jury trial, um, that part, I, we agree that Blanton's, uh, sorry, Badeau says nothing about the severity of registration and notification, but it absolutely, uh, it's, it's holding covers um, the question of whether a penalty needs to be a punishment. And in fact, Badeau in, um, in footnote 31 specifically calls out Thomas as unpersuasive 
for relying on the ex post facto and double jeopardy clause line of cases to reach its conclusion. And so although the government says it relies on Doe, which is not a uh, double jeopardy case, Doe just actually just cites WM. And Bado itself views um, Thomas as resting on that line of cases. That line of cases has been over implicitly overruled by Bado. And so the only question here now is whether the severity of the 10 year registration and, notifica and notification requirements reflects the legislature's and and in effect society's determination that sexual abuse of a minor is a serious offense. And we think that both the purpose and structure of that penalty reflect that determination and the actual severity in terms of the impacts on a person's life reflect that determination. Thank you, Council. Uh, appreciate the arguments from uh, both sides and the case is now submitted.